Francisca. I am a PhD student here in Leiden and I work in the Computational Astrophysics group. And today I'm going to be talking to you about astrophysical simulations, what they are, and how we use them as tools to do astronomy. So, to begin with, when most people think about scientists, they think about this man in white coats in a lab in the dark, mixing chemicals, maybe laughing evilly. But the truth is that while there are, of course, a lot of scientists that spend uh, most of their research time in a lab, for astronomers, most of our time looks like this. Sometimes it looks like this, it's true, but most of the time it looks like this. And while there are some astronomers that do experiments on labs, uh, for most of us, our work happens behind the computer. Even if you are an observational astronomer and you go to observatories, most of your work will be done behind the computer. The problem is that as astronomers, we can't really do experiments over our objects of study. Let's say if I'm studying the movement of the planets of the solar system, I can't just go and take a planet and move it and move it and see what happens because it just doesn't make any sense. The planets are so big, and even if I do, let's say I want to do an experiment and see what happens if I change the positions of Jupiter and Saturn in the solar system, that could be a fun experiment, but it would probably cause so much chaos in the solar system that we would die. So not a good idea for an experiment. So the thing is that if you study the movements of the planets, or if you study black holes, or if you study the evolution of stars in galaxies very far away, you can't really do empirical experiments with your objects of study. Well, here you can say, okay, but we have all these big telescopes all around the world, so why don't we just observe these objects and decide? Why do you need experiments when you can observe what's going on in space through these telescopes? The thing is that uh, there is another problem, and this that astrophysical processes are very, 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 extremely slow. And we don't even have to leave our solar system for an example of this. For example, Neptune was discovered in the year 80, uh, 1846, and it only completed a full orbit around the Sun since its discovery in 2011. Pluto was discovered in the 1930, and it won't finish an orbit around the Sun until the year 2178. So nobody here, none of us that are standing here tonight will be alive to see Pluto complete a full orbit around the Sun, because it takes it more than 200 years. Now, these are just examples in the solar system, but really 200 years in astronomy time is nothing. It's like less than a second of your day. When we talk about astronomical times, we're talking about thousands of years, millions of years, and even thousands of millions of years that take for these processes to happen. So even if I have a telescope dedicated to observe the special cluster that I wanted to study, and I was going to observe it all night, every night, I would not be able to notice any change in my lifetime. Because astronomical processes are so slow that seriously it would take thousands of years to see some changes. So what do we do? Like, we are lost here. What do we do? How do we experiment in astronomy? Well, now comes into play one of the things that is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful things in physics. And he said we can just take a, we can take just a small amount of physical laws or physical equations, just a very okay, maybe not so small, but a very constrained group of physical equations, and we can use them to model an enormous amount of physical phenomena. Of course, here I'm talking about all the science, but in particular in astronomy, just using a very few number of equations, we can model the evolution of stars. We can model the movements of planets around stars. We can model the behavior of matter around a black hole. So we can take all of these equations and actually model the processes that we are observing. And this is not just something new. It has not just been happening for the right uh, for the late years. It has been happening for thousands of years. Since the beginning of time, men have been observing the sky. They have been analyzing the movement of the planets and the astronomical objects in the sky. They have been using these observations to the right laws that uh, guide this movement, and they have made predictions. So here I have just a few examples of, for example, an ancient Greek computer that was used to calculate the positions of planets in the sky. Also star maps, Chinese star maps from more than a thousand years ago that were not just used to track the positions of the planets but also to make predictions about their movements and about eclipse. Same with the Mayas, they made very precise predictions about eclipse and the movement of the planets. 
And probably my favorite example of this kind of thing, of just taking through equations and predicting the physics, the behavior of your system, is the discovery of Neptune. So Neptune was discovered in 1846, but a few years before that, some astronomers have been observing the orbit of Uranus, that was the last planet that had been discovered so far, and they realized that there was something wrong with its orbit. It was not following the orbit that it should have according to physics. So they realized that there must be something else there perturbing this movement of this planet. They actually made the calculations. They calculated the mass, the size, and the orbit of this new object that nobody had seen, but it had to be there to be perturbing the orbit of Uranus. And then they made predictions. They say, OK, so if our calculations are right, this object should be in this position on this certain night. And they took a telescope, and they observed it, and there it was. The planet was there. So Neptune was actually the first planet to be discovered theoretically before being observed. So what I'm trying to say to you is that we can take the laws of physics, we can take equations, and we can actually model the behavior of systems, so we can make predictions about their behavior. And the thing is that when Neptune was discovered, we had to do, well, not we, sorry, these people had to do <laughs> all these calculations by hand. They had to take a piece of paper and a pencil and start writing the equations. And I think all of us have been in a math test when we make a uh, mistake at the beginning and then we get it all wrong until the end. These things can happen when you make these sort of calculations by hand. It's very prone to human errors. So thankfully, nowadays, we have these amazing tools called computers. Okay, so great. Computers are much better or much faster at doing math than us. They can do much uh, precise calculations. So let's just take our physics, put it into the computer, and yeah, we've got a simulated universe, and we can observe whatever we want. Well, it's really actually not that simple, because computers think in a different way that humans do. So we have our computer, and we have our laws of physics. That we, have, that we want somehow the computer to understand and to use to calculate these physical problems. So what we have to do is we actually have to take the problem we want to solve. Let's say that I want to solve the movement of the solar system in the beginning. And I have to take this problem, I have to write down all the equations that I need, and then I have to turn it into something that the computer will understand. And this, we have to completely change the problem so the computer will be able to calculate it. The computer solves this problem in a completely different way than we do. So we turn this physics problem, this theoretical problem, into a numerical problem that the computer can solve. And of course, this is also not easy work. The more complex system that you want to model, the more equations you will have, and the bigger the, the problem that you have to give to your computer. So this is actually, this takes a lot of work, and this is where not just astronomers come in, but also computer scientists and engineers, and teams of people that work months and months to be able to turn physical questions into problems that the computer can solve. So, they try to transform this problem into something for the computer. They also test it to make sure that we're making the right results. Because it's true, if we do it by hand, we are more prone to errors. But the computer will only do what we tell it to do. So we make a, a mistake at the beginning. This mistake will also carry on for all our simulation. So we actually have to test this code a lot of times. And we have to do a lot of proving that everything is right. And OK, so we're finished. We have our code. The computer understands what we want to solve. And I say, OK, computer, I want to simulate the first years of the solar system. OK, great. So I put my code in. I put my question in, my data, the positions of the planets where I want to start. And then, of course, I have to wait. Because it's true. If we have some simple simulations, computers will always be faster than humans. And so, sometimes it will take seconds. Sometimes it will take days. And sometimes it will take even weeks or months to run just these very complex simulations when we want to create a whole galaxy in the computer. There's a lot of physics going on, so it takes a lot of time even for the computer to solve it. Okay, so we wait a couple of days, we are ready, we are very anxious to see what our computer is going to say about our simulation. We really want to see what the solar system looked at the beginning, so now we have the results and we get this. <laughs> Yeah, so astronomers want to do statistics over the results. So, of course, we need the physical properties of the objects that we are studying. 
But if we really want to understand the physics of what's happening, we don't just want to see a bunch of numbers that we have at the end of the simulation. We have to see all of this time that we created in this computer. If I started from the solar system at the beginning, I want to see what happens in the end. I want to see the whole movie. And thankfully, these teams of people that work on putting this code into the computer also work in tools to visualize these results. So here I'm going to show you a small simulation of what we call the NIST model. This is a model for actually the beginning of the solar system. And you will notice here that it's the orbits of the four giant planets, but Uranus and Neptune's orbits are switched. Neptune's orbits was actually inside Uranus' orbits. And this is the Kuiper belt, a belt of asteroids around the solar system. So here we are running a simulation of what might have happened during the first year of the solar system. And if you look at the number there at the top, you see that it says 800 something millions of years. So this is something that we would be never be able to observe in a real system. Even if we took a telescope and we found a planetary system where this was happening, we wouldn't even be able to tell because it takes millions of years for things to change. So we weren't able to see this. But we can make a movie. So what do we do? We actually can observe, for example, what the solar system looks right now. So we can start making different movies with different initial conditions. Let's say, what if we, instead of uh, Neptune and Uranus, I switch Jupiter and Saturn or whatever, and we can run thousands of these simulations and actually look at the results at the end and say, okay, which one looks closer to what we observe right now? Okay, so this group of simulations looks closer to our current solar system. Okay, so maybe these are the models that are, that are working sort of right. So the thing is that, so physical simulations uh, are a point where astronomy theory and astronomy observations get together. Uh, here I'm going to show you another movie. This is a simulation of the evolution of a star cluster. And one second in this movie corresponds to 600,000 years of real evolution. Again, this is something that we will never be able to see in real life. But we can see, if you have seen pictures of star clusters on the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, you see that it actually would look like a snapshot of this video. And that's exactly what we do. We take astronomical observations to compare with the results of our simulations and to make sure that we have better models. And at the same time, we use simulations and models to better understand the things that we are looking at at the sky. Because when we look at a star cluster, we would, we would just see like a snapshot of this movie. We don't see the whole evolution. But maybe if we make this movie, we can understand how it looked before and how it will look in the future. So we use simulations to understand better what's happening on the universe, and we use observation to make better simulations for us to understand the universe. Here you can see that some stars eventually turn red, and if you were here for the last astronomy on top of that, you might remember that as, as some stars die, they grow bigger and they get more red, and this is exactly what ha what's happening here. We are looking at the evolution of the complete life of stars, which is some, something that takes millions of years and we will not be able to see in real life. Okay, so last I want to say that it's true that now we have computers to help us with simulations. But we also have supercomputers, which means that we can make bigger simulations. And with bigger simulations, I don't mean that we can now uh, use them to work on galaxies or on bigger astronomical objects, but that actually we can use much more detail on the simulations that we are making. And the more detail that we can add to our simulations, the better we can understand the processes that are behind the objects that we are observing. So this is a simulation developed here in Leiden, and it's the Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda, our neighbor galaxy, and these galaxies are going to crash four billion years from now, so you don't have to worry about it. But this is something that might happen in that moment, and this is a simulation uh, designed with a supercomputer where every single particle of star and gas in the galaxy is modeled. So we are looking at a very, probably a very realistic uh, impression of what might happen with this two galaxies crash. So uh, what I would like you to take home from this talk is that simulations help us understand observations. Observations help us make better simulations. The simulations are really cool and the biggest 
sugar computers, they will get even cooler. Thank you.